my eyes wander a little bit. Uh, and that's because uh, my nervous system was heavily damaged when I was a small baby. And that nearly killed me, but it didn't, which is a good thing for me. And the upshot was that I had serious um, muscular and neurological damage um, to my eyes of all places for some reason. So my mother um, being very, very engaged and um, never taking no for an answer when she had a cause that she was invested in, she contacted all the specialists uh, and took me to many appointments and consultations to see, you know, what could be done for my eyes. And uh, they all said pretty much that there wasn't really anything that could be done, that they, that I would lose my vision eventually. She never gave up. She uh, spent um, a couple of years talking to doctors. And then uh, there was a young doctor. And he um, was a remarkable man. He felt that, that, in fact, my sight might be able to be saved. And he, as far as I know, had done no patient trials on this procedure. It so happened that the um, Emperor of Japan had a child my age who had a similar problem and required the same procedure. Uh, the other day I was reading in the paper that uh, the current Emperor of Japan, who's in, who's in his 80s, as are my parents, uh, is going to be stepping down uh, to make way for his heir. And I thought about his heir and what I owe to that person by their need because they needed to find a test, someone to, uh, someone to do a patient trial on this procedure. Very poor artists. We could not in any way have afforded uh, what constituted, you know, cutting edge state of the art surgery and, you know, this it was it was just something completely beyond our means but because they needed me as much as i needed them uh, the doctor um, agreed to do the entire procedure for a couple of paintings by my father it was a it was a very scary thing because you know i was facing probable blindness but the question really was um if I would have a procedure, any kind of procedure, that could potentially cure or delay that and therefore have a certain amount of time with sight or do a risky operation, which might work, but could also end my sight sooner. Even I was five when the procedure was done, I, I understood that I might not see again. And unfortunately, no one uh, really thought the thing through and told me that no matter whether the operation was a failure or a success, when I regained consciousness, I wouldn't be able to see for quite some time because my eyes would be sutured shut while they healed. So I, I recovered and I couldn't see and I thought the operation had failed and it, evidently I had to be sedated a few times and slowly introduced to the fact that in fact the operation had succeeded but that I wouldn't be able to see for a while. And it, it took a while. I, I was extremely upset. I think it affected all of my development that came afterwards. Uh, in fact, that memory of waking up in terror and awareness of blindness is one of my earliest childhood memories. And that feeling of relief and gratitude and hope when I understood my situation is one of my other earliest childhood memories. Someone was saying to me that, you know, that the 
the emperor was so lucky that they had someone to test on and that he owes to me, you know, that he had the successful operation. And that, of course, is one way to look at it, but I'm so grateful to him that he needed me because everything that is in this room, everything I've done has been because I can see. The studio always feels um, incipient. You walk in and it starts suggesting possibilities. It always suggests things to do. It's sometimes overwhelming. I come in here and I think about so many things I want to do that that can be daunting. Bronze offers me another beautiful material, like stone, that is lighter, stronger, uh, more expensive to make initially, but less expensive to exhibit over the, over the arc of, of an artwork's life. And I learned to speak that language of the, of the metal, you know, the colors and the, um, what can be done with metal as I had originally started in doing in stone, my, my thesis at Harvard was on polychromy in stone and using um, intarsio techniques and encaustic techniques and other methods to bring skull color and, and work with color in stone. And, and I loved that, but I, you know, as I say, when I actually applied it to the practicalities of exhibiting, it was, it just wasn't a possibility. A few years ago in London, I did this talk about bronze uh, as the sweet metal. It occupies a place, like a perfect place in a sculpture material where it has the ability to flow any way you want it to go, to become hard enough to be durable and yet soft enough to be workable. And that's an unusual thing, if you think about it. So you can direct bronze like your thoughts. And then you can see how it would become absolutely permanent and indelible. And yet, when even it's achieved that state of hardness, you can go back in and change it again. So this ability to be both permanent and impermanent is a wonderful thing for an artist. It allows the artist to solidify their, their ideas and then modify their ideas with this material that is always responsive uh, in a kind of ideal way. I perceive in society uh, a lot of problems where people don't understand what artists are doing and feel alienated and sometimes even confused and insulted. And so what I've tried to do with my own work is create work that has different levels of understanding. So depending on how much you want to read into what I'm doing, you can get different things out of it. So you can look at it from a very simple point of view of, oh, that's a head, 
it looks old, it looks like it's suffered in some way, and make a connection, a very simple, literal connection. You can look at it historically, um, literarily, verbally, um, trying to figure out what the references are and what the story is and what the narrative and what the history and what kind of statement intellectually is being made. Or, uh, when I'm very successful, I hope that it also works on purely artistic terms as something that works with one kind of visual language but speaks to another about our state of humanity. I'm like an archer who's got not one arrow on their bow, but three. And I'm trying to hit three targets at once. this for one second for you myself. And this place makes some spiders homeless for a few minutes, then they can come back to trying to make my sculpture look like it's been here for a century. Studios are plagued by dust, and in the summer, spiders. And a lot of times they're improving the work, but we'll try to make the work clear. This sculpture here you're asking about, actually, originally I did the first iteration of this very early in my career, in the 80s, and it was... Um, an identity piece. This is called the Mask of Appearances. And it was using the uh, iconography of religious shrine art, especially what you see in like the 13th uh, century and 14th century, uh, where little spaces are created to depict a kind of scene, like a little theater in, in permanent 3D that tells a story. Um, the story that this piece tells is not about religion unless you interpret um, identity and self-awareness as a form of faith. And essentially it deals with the dichotomy, the the separation between who we think we are, who we feel we are in terms of what our identity is, and the face we present the world. And there are many disconnects. And this face, which is really an empty shell which weighs us down, is directed towards this figure which kind of muse-like floats above and is idealized and feminine because this figure is a male, so this is a, an aspirational thing, this, this blank, heavy, burdensome face staring at this beautiful creature which is part of a tableau of the disinterested. And, and yet, what this person is really looking at is the ground. And in order to make this presentation to the world requires that every sinew and every muscle is strained to carry the weight, to crawl forward on your hands and knees. And the question becomes, will this be you or will this be you? And at what point will you be able to shed the mask of appearances? Students are always different superficially, but in terms of the kinds of people 
that are interested in art, they're always essentially the same. And it's an interesting thing, and you can see it, it's not just about studying art, but if you take somebody into the studio, you can learn a lot by just watching as they walk into a space with art. And one person, for instance, a very nice couple, came into the studio just last week. Very nice people, intelligent, educated, very pleasant, polite, good manners. And they walked in and they talked to me. And they stood with their backs to all of the art and they never looked around. And they were polite, they were engaged, they were interested in what I had to say. But nothing in this room spoke to them visually at all. There was nothing that created a question. There was no part of the dialogue, and it was, this was an introductory conversation, our first conversation together. It never entered their minds. It never, it, they never thought, wow, there's a lot of visual information here, and something's going on here. I have a question. Now, maybe they were shy, which is possible. But I've seen this over and over again, not just with my work in my studio, but people walking into galleries or spaces where there's art, where maybe they didn't set out to see art, but art was there, and they don't see it. So that's one kind of person who just simply visual ideas, visual information, doesn't cause a response. And there's another type of person, they walk into a room, you see them react, you see their pupils change shape, you see them change their breathing. Maybe they have a question, maybe they don't. That's not important, you see them react. The reason I can communicate to them is because they're moved by visual objects. And that's a universal. So what I'm doing is I'm letting the heat of the tool soften the wax and then modeling it. I'm not trying to force it. Uh, one of the maxims of any profession that uses tools is let the tool do the work. And that, that's the case with modeling with, with, a, with a wax tool. It's you want to let the tool heat the wax up and do the work, not force it. Because basically you'll probably just detach the wax from them. All right. So I think that you guys ought to get to work. Mm -hmm. I will make some coffee. Mm -hmm. For Donatello, mm -hmm. you really have much more linear figures. Uh, but if you look back in history, in fact, there's a, a beautiful uh, charioteer that was found off Sicily and uh, from, um, from the Greek uh, period. And it's, it's actually early, early. It's, like, it's not quite Hellenistic. It's like pre-Hellenistic. It's the um, severe stage. Uh, and it has this beautiful twist to it. And then that, you know, and, and that was one of those transition pieces into Hellenistic art where you have the, the shoulders moving in a different direction from the mm -hmm. hips. You have very fluid compositions. The problems of carving stone are no longer a limitation. They've, they've figured out how to observe the anatomy. They figured out how to uh, see what they're seeing instead of what their, you know, instead of what their left brain is telling them they're seeing. Mm. And then they've, they've conquered all of the material limitations. They've, they've basically acquired all this information over, over a couple of thousand years and are now <coughs> essentially within the, the, within the confines of gravity limitless in what they can do. There's no limitation on what they can do. And, and you have uh, a couple of thousand years of that kind of capacity and then you have the collapse of the Roman Empire and with it the loss of that entire knowledge set. Mm. And then you have a period over about 200 years where that knowledge set rebuilds 
during the Renaissance. And there's not actually a lot of surviving bronzes from the Greeks that show like uh, advances in contrapposto and things like that and, and advances in direct work. So I don't, I don't see evidence when I look at classical art of wax <coughs> bringing about the idea of fluidity and form, but certainly in the Renaissance mm. is all about the wax. But I want to show you um, two artists who sort of branched off from that idea of what I call a smooth form evolution, which Rodin sort of led us into in the beginning of modern, um, modern history and modern art. And one is Brancusi. And his most famous piece is uh, The Bird in Space, which is really an absolute reduction of that kind of observation and simplification. And it expresses motion and, and, and you know, upward movement. He spent a lot of time on this. It's another one, different form. Bird in space. This is the fish. Same sort of idea. It's another fish. He was fascinated by tribal art and simple art. And he moved ever more into simplification and reduction. Uh, this is a period when he and Modigliani and Picasso were all being influenced by things. But one of the things that differentiated Brancusi is that he was fascinated by, um, he was a Romanian, and he was fascinated by this large, heavy uh, carving style, this architectural style that was prevalent and there in part of the folklore architecture, vernacular architecture. and. You know, here's a more absurd thing. He was working towards simplification, reduction, and he starts to bring in that language of architecture into his sculpture. <coughs> and blur the lines between design and, and fine art sculpture. Yes. And, and he brings this kind of Asiatic, almost uh, Zen-like quality to things. And, and the, the pedestal, extremely mm. important. So the whole thing is, is tied mm -hmm. together. And he starts to, he gets to this point where he's really reduced things to shapes that are um, multi-referential and suggestive and extremely modern. The other directions, the other two artists I wanted to look at, coming out of the same thing, one is Louise Bourgeois, who, like Brancusi, was very influenced by um, tribal art and, mm -hmm. and ethnic art, <coughs> but also very influenced by organic shapes. Let's see the reference point here. And then she's working with modeling and natural forms as kind of like a beehive. This looks like some kind of insect or, or multi teated animal. Mm -hmm. She was very fascinated by biomorphism and sexual organs and there's a real sort of sexual thing to a lot of her stuff. See, this is bronze. Mm -hmm. And then she, she started, she went from doing these things in latex and <coughs> in uh, various uh, plaster and things like that. She started to do them in bronze. And when she did that, one of the reasons why I wanted to show this to you is that for me, all of these ideas kind of came together in bronze mm -hmm. because bronze offers this liquid appearance when you polish it. And it's perfect for telling this story that the thing is both an object and a natural form. And, and these are some of her famous, very famous um, bronzes. It's very sexual imagery, but also very natural and organic. And very interesting. It's really, it's really a thought-provoking piece. Here you can see the strong influence of Brancusi, but she's turned those heads into breasts. And and they're actually quite beautiful. And they also remind me of nuts. This reminds me of an acorn. Thank you. 
Harry Kemp said that every piece of wood you pick out here, the driftwood, mm -hmm. is a, has an animal shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I tried it out. Every time I picked up a piece of wood, I could see it. I quoted you in my workshop, quoting Harry. Oh. Huh? I quoted you quoting Harry in my oh, workshop. Yeah. Oh, well, you had the workshop yeah. last week. Yeah. Yeah. This one I also found. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody did very well. The duck. That was right before mom ah. got sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Even little pieces like this. And this one, look. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's lovely. It's lovely. Chestnuts. We had a basket like this full of chestnuts. Yeah. We ate the chestnuts by the fire. Then I took him into Romolo's studio to show him the guitar. Oh, his eyes fell out of his head. He was so impressed. Maybe I'll finish that guitar one day. That's my wish. What's pietà? Pietà means pity in Italian. It refers to when Mary um, took Christ out of his grave, after, down from the cross, rather, and she held him in her arms, he's, he's crucified. It's, it's one of the most uh, revered images in Catholicism. But the most famous Pietà is Michelangelo's first Pietà, but he did four. And his most amazing, actually, is his last Pietà. Oh, wow. That's the one I show class all the time. It's the That's... Rondonini Pietà. And I saw it. I saw it in 1954 when the museum itself had been bombed by the, by the Allies and so that there was no door. I knew the sculpture was there, so I said to the guide, I said, where is the Pietà of Michelangelo, the Rondanini Pietà? Signor, non c'è. Come non c'è? Lo so che sta qui. Beh, allora, I gave him a... 10,000 lira. <laughs> but there was no door, there was just a curtain, I mean, a, 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 a carpet yeah. hung up temporarily. Wow. Imagine that? Yeah. One of the greatest pieces of art in the entire world. And there's this, this rug holding it. Well, you know, the, the Last Supper, yeah. all the walls were blown away. Oh, I know. The only wall that was left standing was Da Vinci's Last Supper. Wow. Every single other wall of that church was knocked down by the bombardments. We're getting back to the Pietà, yeah. so I entered this great big room in the museum. It's a castle, actually. 
And the room was like 20 meters square, big, with a ceiling high. Total darkness, except for one light. And it was right on the Michelangelo Biatal. Josie and I just burst into tears. It was so moving, it was so beautiful. There's a Christ hanging there with no arms. You know the beautiful thing is how these things go on, you know? Somehow or another, things go on. That's what I was like, I was telling Gleb, you know, that, like you were saying about this time that uh, Echo wrote about in the name of the road. Almost everything is lost. Yeah. And then a few hundred years later, you have the Renaissance. Yeah. It's, it's just the nature of humanity. The last one on the bottom is Ulysses Unbound. I did this show about Ulysses and the Sirens. Well, about the, uh, the island Ulysses went by in the Odyssey where the Sirens were singing is the island of my ancestor, now known as Ischia, but in ancient Greece it was called Pithecusa. I built the studio myself uh, 30 years ago, and all the wood in this place is recycled wood. Much of it came from a, a sea wharf, you know, for the, for the sea, and so it's good heavy stuff. This floor is five inches thick. You could land an airplane on here, it wouldn't do anything. <laughs> Some people say to me when they come to the studio, when they, when they pose, they say, why is you don't have music on? I said, well, when I was younger, I needed the music because I wasn't sure what I was doing. Now that I'm older, I don't care anymore. So I, I want to sit it to be with me in the thoughts so that we're together doing this work. In other words, the sitter is as important as the painter. It's the dialogue between the two of us. Is a, is a homage. Oh. 
homage to seven fishermen who went down with the boat. They were fishermen. And the man in the middle is the son of the man who had the boat. And that's his son. Now this son is fishing now. It goes on, the tradition. The Portuguese are the, probably the best fishermen in the world. And this guy here, I guess his, his family came from Cape Verde. I'm not sure, but he's fished and hunts all his life, he's done. And he's a very close friend of mine. In fact, he's, he's, he's got more sensitivity to nature than most intellectuals. And he never went to, he's just public school, that's all. But this guy, when he goes hunting, he hunts with a bow and arrow. He says he's got some Indian blood in him, American Indian blood. And he stays in a tree sometimes 15 hours waiting for the deer to come underneath. And then he gets his bow and he gets it. And he always gives me a big chunk of the meat. And this guy, Lorenzo, he's the intellectual. He also fished and worked on scientific research boats, went all over the, the world. And the guy in back of him, he's my hippie, my hippie fisherman. He's from the 60s. He was in Vietnam and saw a lot of action. And he's kind of an individual. He likes to be by himself. He would never pose for anybody, but he said, I'll pose for you, Sal. So I was very honored. So I did three paintings like this, not like this, but commemorating the, the thing that happened, you know? What happened was there was a scalloping boat. And uh, in the 60s, somebody discovered a big bed of them, you know, a big area full of scallops. So all the boats from around here came. There were hundreds of boats and they kept digging and getting the scallops and filling them up and then bringing them home and getting good money. But some of them were a little, they did things they shouldn't have done. The boat is designed so that when they put the, when they put the scallops on the deck, there's little openings on the side of the boat so that the, when the wave comes over, the water can wash out and not stay on the boat. But when they filled the deck with the overflow of the fishing of those of this scallop shells, there was no way of where, where the water could go. So it went down into the forecastle of the of the crew and they died. The boat went down. When he was four or five, we used to keep a, a, a block of plastic in, in Josephine's studio, my wife's studio, and he used to go in there and spend the day, and he'd make these little animals. I couldn't believe it. They could do this, you know? Beautiful little ducks, pigs, chickens, goats, because we had a lot of animals then. Mm -hmm. And he did these beautiful things. So then when he was 16, I gave him a, a birthday present of a class in Castle Hill, there was a woman there who taught sculpture. She was a very good friend of mine, and she was very good. She was competent. And so I gave him a birthday present of a, a summit under her protection, under her tutelage. And she taught him a lot. But I, what I taught him was, I hope I taught him, was the, the essence of, of art, what it is. It doesn't matter what the medium is. It could be paint, sculpture, music, literature, anything that tries to portray the inner feelings of the artist, the person who's creating it. And I said, you've got to keep that alive because if it dies, that's it, you're done. And you can't let commercialism enter it, into it because it'll eat away at it, you know? But you could never do those things unless you knew what the sense of suffering is because suffering is, Pain is very close to loving. It's very close. There's Josephine and me in happier days. 
this is the the Marquette. He gave, made this for his mother. I love that. He was 18 when he did that. These are the Maenads. You know about the Maenads? In Greek mythology, they used to eat their babies and they were crazy women, I guess. He made a tree out of it. I love, I love that. It's one of my favorite pieces. I always loved to draw. When I was about seven or eight, I used to draw my mother and father every night on strips of paper, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I had. And then my brothers and sisters would pose me. Then my aunts and my cousins and my aunts. So it was, it was predetermined that I was going to be a painter. But I had a problem because as a young man, I had a, they said it was a beautiful tenor voice. I could sing, you know? So I had to make a decision. I said, if I study music and I sing, the chances are, the most I'll have, if I'm lucky, is 20 to 30 years of professional life. But if I paint, which I really love most of all, I can paint till the day I die. And that's why I chose painting instead of singing. But I've always loved singing. I love music. I love all, all kinds of music. So I never, do, I never abandoned that. But painting is my first love, and I stayed with it. I've postponed this show that I was working on because things in life make that direction not reasonable. Uh, it's not how the time needs to be structured. It's not where I need to be putting my thoughts. A show is a very consuming and self-absorbing thing, like going down um, a rabbit hole in your own creative psyche and mind and ego. And a family tragedy is the opposite. It's you checking your ego aside, uh, putting it like a hat on a coat rack, and you walk into the house and you hang up your hat, and now you're, you're amongst other people. And in a case of a family tragedy, you're amongst your family and friends and their needs, and you have to be open to that, and you, so you can't be locked inside yourself. The, the two things are opposite directions. Well, I never stopped working, uh, I never stopped thinking about my work, and that's what I use to manage everything in life. It's, it's the filter for me. I don't, I don't want to indulge myself in getting lost in it right now, uh, the way I would need to do to finish a show, to bring all these pieces of metal together into the sculptures I have in my mind. Because when you 
when you make something, it's, it starts out as, as a unified idea, then you cut it apart, you cast it, and then you bring it back together. Like this piece here is almost done being put together. Um, but now it has to wait. And these other pieces are pieces of other sculptures that need to come together. And now they're going to wait. It's going to be so hot today.
see this flowing. This is from the heat. Usually by August we don't get this kind of heat. It's unusual. <laughs> 